On the 24th of August 2020, I was out with my family at Emsby Railway, enjoying a wonderful ride on the steam engines during the brief release of lockdown restrictions. I will never forget that day, as it was the day that cemented my decision to pursue my love for steam engines and the history of the railway. It took a few weeks to set the idea and decided what I wanted to focus on, but uh, today, the 13th of September 2021, it is this channel's first birthday. It is jaw-dropping that the channel is one, and that I still have the same love and passion that I had from the day I started. I feel for this being big and special, we needed a topic just as big and special, and when it comes to big and larger than life, there is no one better than George Hudson, the Railway King himself. So let's delve in, shall we? George Hudson was a local lad, born in Yorkshire on the 10th of March, 1800. His family was the largest family in the area, and the village of Howsham prided itself on its farming industry. Country life didn't suit George. His parents had died by the age of eight, and he was the middle child to ten siblings. His older brother took care of the household, but he had learnt to be independent and despised any form of education that bared no practical use or profit. George was attracted to the nearby city of York and wanted to learn more than just farming. At the age of 15, he got an unexpected kick from the locals after they learned that he was the father of an illegitimate child. No one knows who the mother or the child was, and or even if they survived childbirth, and George never spoke of it, but it is possible there is a line of his family that are unaware who they are related to. Glad to turn his back on Housham and the trials he had there, George arrived at the gates of the historic city. The city had little in way of manufacturing, unlike Leeds and Bradford, and mainly survived on farmers trading wares. The first step was to obtain a decent job. He found an apprenticeship in a local draper's shop, and where he would describe the time there as his pappiest of his life. There he met Elizabeth. Elizabeth was four years older than him, and a simple girl, but he wasn't interested in her looks or intelligence, more in her connections and money. He did, however, love her, but as with many Yorkshire men of the time, he wore his hat on his sleeve. In 1821, George came of age and not only married Elizabeth, but entered into a partnership with her brother Richard. They started a family, but the first three children would sadly die in infancy. Elizabeth and George would go on to have more children, and for a while, things were bliss. In the early months of 1827, George got news that his great uncle Matthew had fallen gravely ill. George was not normally sympathetic, but he had rushed over to his uncle's bedside and suddenly began to spend a great deal of time with him. Some may see this as a caring gesture, but when you consider that Matthew was one of the richest men in, his, in the city, George's motives may not have been as honest as one may think. Matthew died on the 25th of May and left George a staggering £30,000 in his will. Now catapulted to one of the richest men in the area, George was subjected to malicious rumours and snide remarks about his sudden changing of the will and how more legitimate and closer members of Matthew's family didn't get a cut. George did regret it in later life, but many shamed him for the behaviour. George decided to move away from the draper's shop that he'd been living in and moved to Monkgate. George had the means now to make an influence and it didn't feel right to be over a shop. Once his family was settled, he cast his gaze on the political front with an eager and hungry eye. There was no doubt that the conservative political movement drove George's heart, but he was living at the time in predominantly Whig city, Whigs being the modern day equivalent of our Labour Party. This was going to be a big problem. George got his chance to show his influence when the cholera epidemic hit York in 1832. The illness slept through the swamps of York, killing 185 people. 
The Board of Health were in charge of moving the dead and caring for the sick and were commended for their swift action. George, who had been a leading member of the board, distinguished himself as a public servant by visiting the sick and reporting on their welfare. Once the crisis was over, the board had to decide on an appropriate burial ground for the victims. George got into bitter argument over the proposed location and even though the public loved him, the Whigs and other established men hated George with a passion. They got their chance to humiliate Hudson within the same year. The Whigs introduced a new reform bill giving the middle class men the vote. George was not in favour of this move. The move, in his opinion, would saturate the House of Lords with delegates. He wanted a more structured reform. But in a city run by Whig members, his comments earned him a royal roasting in the public square in front of everyone. Less than a year after the cholera epidemic, several prominent, prominent businessmen from the city got together and wanting to ride the railway boom, formed a railway committee. The plan was to link New York to Leeds and try to piggyback Leeds industrial success, as well as profit from the cheaper imported coal. York Hudson was the founding group's treasurer and predicting the fortune of the company, invested in 500 shares, becoming the largest shareholder. By sheer chance, Hudson met railway founder and pioneer George Stevenson while holidaying in Whitby. Not to miss the opportunity, the two men talked railways, and Hudson was dismayed to discover that George had envisioned a direct route from London to Edinburgh, but the route cutting through nearby Leeds and bypassing York altogether and it was farther advanced than Hudson imagined as the three new routes which started in rugby were in the final stages of development with Leeds being the final destination. Hudson's gamble with the shares paid off as the railway committee consolidated to become the York and North Midland Railway. Hudson suggested the new lines must start in the town of Normanton with a simple wooden structure at York being the terminus. In the meantime, other railway companies were planning to travel south from Darlington and on the 1st of July 1840, York announced it was finally collected to the City of London. Meanwhile, Hudson had begun to close less profitable and lease lines, forcing customers onto their railways. York's dominance of the railways had begun and Hudson was perfectly perched in the centre of the storm. Hudson did not open railways to major cities, he wanted to get coastal towns on the network too. The coast had two big attractions to Hudson. One was freight. Imports such as cotton, tea and sugar was a huge profit, while the gentry who were living in stuffy cities were not only travelling for commerce, but for leisure. Hudson had already invested property in Whitby and the large deep harbour was a promising development. Meanwhile, Scarborough was being touted as the Brighton of the North. Hudson was not one to play clean and would snap up properties and estates like Lonsborough Hall to stop rivals and enemies like George Lehman buying the land for his own schemes. Hudson's influence stretched from the railway to railway and using this he helped create the Railway Clearing House, a unique scheme allowing railways to collaborate and group meaning that fares paid by passengers and those using the lines could be grouped together. This grouping massively helped customers, as they didn't need to buy individual tickets for each separate railway. Hudson didn't just invest in the railways around York, he also invested in the Midland Railway, a direct competitor to the York and North Midland Railway. It was in desperate need of an injection of investment after spiring construction costs, mainly due to George Stevenson's ruling that the tracks cannot have a gradient higher than one in 300. The hemorrhaging money prompted a company inquiry with Hudson at the helm. He devised a scheme to reduce costs, not only in construction, but in staff numbers and wages. Experienced, expensive, competent staff were being laid off in favour of cheap, unskilled workers. Hudson's plan worked, reducing the outgoings by over £11,000, but reliability and efficiency suffered. 
It all came to a head on the 12th of January 1843 when a driver of a goods train at Barnsley Station missed a red signal and ploughed into the back of a standing mixed passenger good and goods train, killing passenger Richard Harvey. The crash prompted a public outcry to restore the company to its former efficient standards. Hudson was forced to comply with public demand, but he wanted to cut costs further and made an interesting proposal to two other companies the Midlands Counties Railway and the Derby Junction Railway. Just like the Midland, both were suffering financially. Hudson proposed a merger, a -a one-of-a-kind deal that would save on average £320,000 per year. It doesn't sound much today, but back then, this would be a millionaire's dream. The three companies agreed and on the 10th of May 1844, Hudson's empire grew a whole lot larger as he was named the New Midland Railway's first ever chairman. The New Midland Railway would go to absorb other companies and with that, custo- that Hudson was either a part of or was a director. The Great Northern Railway proved to be a huge thorn in Hudson's side. He proposed to help build the railway a brand new line to connect to the city, but the GNR had the last life by using rival routes. This left many shareholders furious. Hudson continued his dominance north, proposing new lines towards Darlington and Durham, offering shareholders significant shares in exchange for capital and support. The spiderweb network stretched as far as Newcastle and Carlisle and threatened to dominate the west coast. Ailing railways were swallowed up by Hudson, offering more and more lucrative plans and deals. Hudson by now had over a thousand miles of track under his control, owned a quarter of the railway companies, was MP for Sunderland and was a three times elected mayor for York and owned multiple exclusive properties. He was the superstar of the railway world, but the bubble was getting thin and it didn't take long to burst with horrific effects. In 1845, Hudson was appointed the chairman of the Eastern Counties Railway and he in turn appointed David Waddington as vice chair. Despite the railway's terrible reputation for its timekeeping and safety, it offered a secondary route from York to London. Hudson set to work, not dealing with the issues, but ordered a dividend payment to be paid to the shareholders, with Waddington cooking the books to appear the payment was from legally earned sources. Hudson cut investment and corners in the Midland Railway further to to line shareholders' pockets. This was the start of the downfall. Propaganda in the form of pamphlets began to allege that Hudson was illegally paying shareholders from the company's capital rather than its profits. Some alleged that the shares he had sold were overpriced. The Great Northern fight and debacle had left a bad taste in many shareholders' mouths and following an investigation, Hudson had to admit he was borrowing money at a high interest rate just to keep his companies afloat. Shareholders who once backed Hudson for his generosity turned the back on the failed king. The Eastern County's railway called for an inquiry into the mismanagement of the finances and the inquiry went ahead despite Hudson's pleas that he would resign. Hudson never attended the meeting, so Vice Chair Waddington faced the wrath of the shareholders. Hudson was blamed wholeheartedly. The Midland Railway set up their own inquiry as did the York and North Midland Railway. Hudson resigned from all three companies and following a report, Hudson was ordered to pay £30,000 for the overvaluation of the shares. His political career was stopped in his tracks when he was accused of bribing government officials with hush money. The York and North Midland finances were scoured during Hudson's tenure and more irregularities were uncovered and this included the use of capital by Hudson to use a to build a private station at Lonsborough Hall. By the autumn of 1849, Hudson was found to owe the company over £750,000. Hudson was forced to sell Lonsborough Hall and give its proceeds about 200000 begrudgingly to the new chairman of the YNMR and his arch rival, George Lehman. George offered a lifeline to Hudson. He was willing to consider the debt from his portion of the railway settled for 50,000. Hudson refused the offer and the railway was faced with no other option than to take Hudson to court. Hudson lost. 
and ended up owing much, much more. Hudson was forced to sell his newbie park property and repay the railway, but it simply wasn't enough. Even though he faced the courts as an MP, Hudson could not be imprisoned. Hudson's luck worsened when he was defeated in the 1859 general election. His fortune was gone. All faith the public had in him was destroyed. He was left a broken man with a mountain of debt and his immunity gone. Facing no other option than debtor's prison, Hudson fled. He returned from a brief period for his brother's funeral and settled in Whitby. Using his previous business ties, he managed to get himself re-elected. It was seeming that he would win, but just before the election, he was arrested and taken back to York. Hudson would witness the Tories appoint local man Charles Bagnall to Hudson's position and hear about his win from his prison cell. Hudson remained in debtor's prison until October 1865. Hudson still had many friends who were willing to clear his debts and to set him free. By now, Hudson was old and a frary frail. The North Eastern Railway were hot on Hudson's trail and demanded that he too must pay for their debt. Hudson moved abroad, but he had to return to London less than a year later. He was arrested and spent three weeks in London White Cross Street Prison. The trial between him and the NER would be tried in his absence. The debt was at first agreed at £14,000, but this was restored to over just over £60,000 on appeal. In the North, news of Hudson's case covered the papers. Hudson's friends set up a trust fund in his honour, which was specially protected from the creditors. The fund allowed Hudson to live modestly in London, without the fear of prison. In 1870, it was considered illegal to send debtors to prison, and the NER, facing the fact they were never going to get their funds back, dropped the case. Hudson's extraordinary life came to an end on the 14th of December 1871, following a brief illness. He was taken on his final journey to York and was greeted with a warm, sombre reception. On his funeral, hundreds turned out to pay their respects for the former mayor. Hudson is buried in Scraingham, a small parish not far from Howsham. Whichever way you look at him, Hudson was either a despicable villain or a business genius. His business tactics were questionable, and some were downright illegal. But if it weren't for him, the network wouldn't what it be what it is today, and York would not have been the railway powerhouse certainly is now. His portrait hands in the mansion's house. The portrait shows his power, but the frame is intentionally scratched and warm, reminiscent of his fall from grace. The street, which was named Hudson Street in his honour, was renamed Railway Street. Then it was reinstated on Hudson's centenary of his passing in 1971 and York has many memorials to him, showing where he lived and worked. Strangely though, there are no statues commemorating his achievements. The only known sculpture of his likeness that is still visible today is a bust, which resides in the National Railway Museum's warehouse. Few can doubt Hudson's greed and power had gotten to him, and even if he conceded it was a disaster of events. However, we have a lot to thank him for, by leading the charge, he ensured that the railways had an excellent foundation and room to grow for future generations and innovations. I still can't believe that the channel is one year old. Feels like yesterday I nervously started making videos with a 10 year old computer and an Xbox headset. I feel very humbled and honored that all of you are still here and supporting me. I adore making every video and I'm always curious for ideas. I will do my utmost to keep up my weekly schedule, but I may be forgiven if I miss a week. I couldn't resist bringing this special out on the channel's first birthday, but I didn't feel it right bringing this out on its scheduled time. I know that Saturday was a particularly bad day and certainly a time for reflection, certainly to those in America and there are families still grieving for those lost 20 years ago. For those affected, I am thinking of you. And to everyone, I want to say a massive, massive thank you. And I love you all. 